This is a time where entrepreneurs were basically seen as washouts who couldn't hack it in the real world, just sort of weirdos. I think that all of these people had a sense that there was something that needed to happen and they couldn't make it happen inside the existing institutions that were there. Do you know the real story about how Silicon Valley got started? The name Silicon Valley stuck, and now we might not be able to imagine what it was called in the early days. But in those days, when it was emerging, it was referred to as Silicon Gulch, Semiconductor Country, California's Route 128, or California's Great Breeding Ground for Industry. In the early 1970s, nobody thought much of it. In today's episode, we're sitting down with a Silicon Valley historian, Leslie Berlin. She's the author of Troublemakers, a book that takes a unique look at a seven-year window throughout the 70s and early 80s in the Valley that spawned five major industries. Those industries include personal computing, video games, biotechnology, modern venture capital, and advanced semiconductor logic. The people behind these industries are iconic. We talk about the names you know, like Steve Jobs and Larry Ellison, but we also discuss people like Sandra Kurtzig, the first woman to take a technology company public, and Bob Taylor, who helped launch ARPANET. Their backgrounds involve, you guessed it, troublemaking. Whether it was wild chemistry experiments, challenging authority, breaking social norms, partying at work, all of these behaviors and all of these people were pushing cultural boundaries. They were pushing these boundaries long before any technology actually got created. So get ready for a look at what Silicon Valley was like before it became Silicon Valley with today's guest, Leslie Berlin. This season of Hidden in Plain Sight is brought to you exclusively by our friends at Splunk, the data to everything platform. Splunk helps organizations worldwide turn data into doing. It's time for data to be more than a record of what happened. It's time to make things happen. Learn more at splunk.com or by clicking the link in our show notes. Leslie, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Troublemakers was an awesome book and you are a Silicon Valley historian. And I wanted to get your take on some of the early stories that we often think we know, but when we dive into the details, we don't know all the details. So first of all, welcome to the show. It's an honor to have you here and I'm excited to talk with you today. Well, it's exciting for me too. I just, I love it that in a place that's so focused on the future with a company like yours, that's so, you know, up to the minute and number two technology podcast Ooh. that to have, you know, to have someone taking a second to just sort of stop and ask, Hey, how is it that we uh, got here is, is always very exciting and gratifying. Great. Yeah. It's uh Really important, I think, because you pinpoint this unique seven-year window in Silicon Valley's history that ended up spawning five industries. So we're talking about personal computing, video games, biotechnology, venture capital as we know it, and advanced semiconductor logic. So how did you zero in on this seven-year period? How'd you get zeroed into it and how'd you start your research? I had written a book about the earlier period, um, sort of the 1960s primarily. And uh, I knew I wanted to do something a little different going forward. There are two things I knew I wanted to do differently. One was my first book had been a biography of an individual, a guy named Bob Noyce, incredibly important. If anyone ever, ever needed a biography and merited one, it was Bob Noyce. The guy co-invented the microchip. He co-founded Intel and Fairchild Sem Semiconductor, which was the first successful silicon company in Silicon Valley. And then on top of that, he was a mentor to Steve Jobs, among other young entrepreneurs. Uh, and when I finished that biography, I was really pleased with it. Super interesting guy. And I also felt like he would have been one of the first people to tell you that although the light of sort of fame shown on him, everything he did was really a, a group story. So I knew the first thing was that I wanted to write about a group of people, um, a, a lot of them not right in the spotlight. And the second thing I knew was that I wanted to pick a time period that was one of just sort of seismic change. Uh, 
And I did it in a really old fashioned way, which is that I, I took out, uh, it was like being back in elementary school. I mean, I took out a giant piece of poster board and I drew a timeline on it and I just started putting dots where significant things happened in Silicon Valley. And there was just this insane cluster between 1969 and 1976. I mean, you named the industries, but the companies coming out just in that little window, uh, you had Intel, Apple, Atari, Genentech, Sequoia Capital, the venture capital firm, and Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield and Byers, another, another key venture capital firm. And you had the first internet transmission coming in. Um, to the San Francisco Bay Area, and you had, it was called the ARPANET at that time, sure. and you, you had um, the, these ideas that had been sort of locked into university labs, uh, because there was really no easy way for them to get out. Uh, they started being kind of released into the world all at the same time. And I just thought, what the heck is going on? You know, it's, it's remarkable to, to see so much compressed into these seven years. And there was so much going on that that decision I made early on that this wasn't going to be just one person's story, but the story of a lot of people turned out to be perfect because how can you talk about that much going on focused just on one individual? Right. And the other companies there like Xerox Park uh, and Ask, where Sandra was the first woman to lead that company to IPO. These are fascinating examples. And they, like you mentioned, are all compressed in that area. When you started to dive into the research, what were you most astonished with that you found out? Maybe something that didn't make it into the book or what was the first uh, real aha moment where you said, you know, these stories need to be chronicled and they need to reach a wider audience? Well, I think, well, it'd be hard for me to choose, um, but I think what comes immediately to mind for me is the story of a young woman named Fawn Alvarez. Sometimes I play a game where I ask people, hey, have you ever heard of the various individuals um, in my book? And um, it's rare for people to know most of them. Most people have heard of a couple of them. No one has ever heard of Fawn Alvarez. Um, she was a, an immediately recent high school graduate, literally had just graduated the week before, started working on the assembly line at a company called Rome, which at the time was a, a little startup, um, but they ended up building very advanced telephone systems, which sounds like, you know, nothing that would be interesting to people today, but they were a huge company. Um, one of the very early companies that IBM actually set its sights on to acquire and did acquire. But Fawn's story, I just loved it because this is someone who started on the assembly line with a high school education and worked her way up becoming sort of a manager on the assembly line and then moving into a, what she just, she knew she wanted to land behind a desk, she said, ended up being the only woman in a, in a job done by men. And as she got better and better at it, they, they decided, oh, that job should be restricted to women. But she just kept climbing and climbing until she ends up being effectively the chief of staff to the president of IBM Rome. I was completely fascinated by this story because it told about a time that was that just doesn't really exist anymore, where there were factory jobs in Silicon Valley, where you could get a job on an assembly line and climb all the way to the top. And by the way, a lot of the people who stayed on the assembly lines were still able to buy houses and live very solid middle-class lives. And we think that story of kind of deindustrialization is really the story more of the uh, Midwest, the Rust Belt, but uh, Silicon Valley, of course it was compressed here as everything is compressed here so that you don't have generations of people working in factories. You basically have one generation where stuff is being, hardware is being built in Silicon Valley and then it's gone. Um, moved overseas. But to have that woman's 
story um, to learn about her and then to, to meet her and be able to tell that story was really wonderful for me and a different kind of story than I'd ever told. Um, something else that really, really surprised me, Chad, was that I hadn't understood how much the birth of the internet uh, was tied to the birth of personal com computing. And again, it turned out the vector ran through an individual, in this case, a guy named Bob Taylor. Right. Uh, and he's another person I profile. And Bob Taylor is one of these people no one has heard of. But um, Bob is the guy who convinced the Department of Defense to start a computer network that today is called the Internet. And then for his kind of his second act, he went and uh, started the lab at Xerox Park that is probably most famous um, for people now because it's where Steve Jobs went in 1979 and saw for the first time uh, a WYSIWYG interface. It's the first time he saw a mouse in use. It's the first time that he saw really advanced computer graphics. He actually didn't notice it, but all the computers were networked to each other. He saw in that moment how incredibly advanced the technology could be, and by, of course, by being advanced, be simple for a user. And that was uh, Bob Taylor's creation. He has so many PhDs on staff, and they're so advanced uh, that the president of MIT worried that there were not going to be enough professors to teach computer science in the universities because they were all working for Bob Taylor. And yet Bob Taylor had a master's degree in psychology <laughs> from the University of Texas. And so he, I mean, it was just a, this amazing story to me. Um, and I also love the story of Sandy Kurtzig, who you mentioned, who was uh, first and foremost, you know, a software entrepreneur. Um, also the first woman to take a tech company public. And what I expected was that that story of Sandy's was going to be a story about what it meant um, to be an outsider because you're a woman. And of course, that was part of the story for sure. Uh, but what came as a surprise to me was that she was a double outsider. I really hadn't appreciated how no one knew what software was. No one, I mean, now Silicon Valley, it's all about software. But at that time, it was all about hardware. It was all about things like phone systems, like Fawn Alvarez was building, or, or disk drives, like IBM was building, or chips, like Intel, or computers, like Apple was building. It was all about physical stuff. I love that answer, and I love the background of all these individuals, because like you mentioned with Sandy, you know, she got to start with an advertising flyer, advertising herself as a dangerous woman on the loose. All of these people have a flair and a spark to them for the unconventional. How did you, you know, in your research, how did you see these individuals? Because in my mind, a lot of these people seem to be iconoclasts and different, um, but in a way, they're really just, you know, they were not afraid to be themselves. How do you see that? This is a time where entrepreneurs were basically seen as washouts who, who couldn't hack it in the real world, just sort of weirdos uh, who couldn't make it in a corporate job. I think that all of these people had a sense that there was something that needed to happen and they couldn't make it happen inside the existing institutions that were there. And you have to remember this time period we're talking about. This is a generation that was dealing with the Vietnam War. And so there was just overall this distrust of sort of authority and an idea that if you wanted to make it, you somehow needed to take care of yourself. The person who sort of talked about that most specifically was Al Alcorn, who worked for Atari, he's the guy who came up with Pong, uh, kind of the was to Nolan Bushnell's jobs at uh, Atari. And Al Alcorn's story opens with the protests at People's Park in Berkeley and gunfire and, you know, people literally, students being gassed and um, him running for cover. 
And this is a guy who I think in another time period would have been uh, very, very happy working behind an engineer's desk at a typical company. But he had really come to feel like uh, all, of the, all of the things that his parents' generation had been taught were going to kind of save them, particularly after the Great Depression. He just felt like he had to rely on himself. And I, I saw that story again and again. It's interesting that at the same time that these people had great confidence in themselves, and I think this is really important, that they had to have people that could make a difference. The way I usually think of it is that innovation is a team sport, uh, but we tend to think of inventors in the same way we think of a pitcher who has just thrown a perfect game. If you were at this baseball game, you, you would have seen the entire team working like crazy. You know, the, the first baseman just like stepping on the bag at the last minute and the catcher making these calls for the, for pitches that were just perfectly calibrated to every batter's weakness and someone in the outfield just running like a crazy person making these incredible saves. But the only thing that goes into the history books is that the pitcher had a perfect game. And I think that the people who succeeded then and honestly who succeed now understand that this is a team effort. I couldn't agree more. And, you know, you mentioned Atari where you know, Nolan Bushnell gets his start as a carnival barker. He's running gambling rings. You know, a lot of these folks had such, uh, you know, backgrounds that were experimental. They were generalists. They also had, you know, these extreme interests. Uh, as you started to study things like, you know, Xerox Park, many of us think we know the narrative there. We might be familiar with folks like Alan Kay. But what was most interesting to you as you studied the Xerox Park story? I had just not appreciated how far ahead these people were. I mean, they were, I know I can't remember if it was 1972 or 1974. They do this demo where they are showing video conferencing from California to, I believe, Miami, Florida. What they're doing is controlling someone's cursor. <laughs> they were so far ahead. And I think that this notion now, I mean, the notion of dedicated research labs have sort of you know, fallen out of favor in a lot of ways. Um, but at that moment, where all of this was so new, uh, these people were really united by a, a quite idealistic view of what computers could be. This, this notion that they should be so easy to use that anyone can use them to speak to each other and communicate and connect with each other. A lot of these people were um, working with things like the People's Computer Company, trying to set up computer access in just around town so that people could learn what these machines were. They were so far ahead in the way they thought and also in what they were able to do. Yeah, I think uh, Mark Weiser, the CTO of Xerox Park, he was all about, you know, getting the technology to disappear. And they were focused on, you know, OK, if it's not magic, it's not good enough technology. So the aspirations there to get, you know, a user interface off of screens and just stuff that was decades and decades ahead of its time is uh, inspiring, to say the least, um, especially when so many people kind of like, you know, fall into the trap of just incremental improvements. The folks at Xerox Park were thinking about, okay, how do we spawn trillion dollar new industries? You know, Alan Kay, he has the famous quote about salespeople should be shot, but the rest of that is uh, basically lamenting the people that want to create millions or billions of wealth and saying, no, this is an opportunity to create trillions of dollars of wealth and spawn, you know, brand new things that we can't even conceive of now. Under Taylor, I really, money just was not something they were thinking about. Um, they were thinking about impact. Right. Uh, as people, as other people started companies and, and a couple of these guys started companies, um, so 3Com, for example, and Adobe, um, and now, my gosh, like if you look at Google, they're sort of gray beards there. A, a huge proportion of them had 
there started Xerox Park or Eric Schmidt. I mean, when you look at sort of the alumni of Bob Taylor's lab at Xerox Park, it is crazy. Um, but their motivation was really, really not to make money. Um, I, I think it got frustrating for some people when other people <laughs> made tons of money off of their ideas. Um, sure. But that was not what inspired them at all. I mean, I think that actually, you were asking me earlier about uh, things that surprised me. Um, one of the things that I think is hard about living in a place that you study um, is sometimes you can run the risk of superimposing your current understanding of things onto the past. And that's something you have to be really careful about. And I had a, an interesting experience when I was talking about the book. I um, was giving a presentation and I recognized that two women in the audience had worked at Atari during the time that I'm writing about. Atari was a, an insane place, like a venture capitalist, uh, Don Valentine, um, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but he's the founder of Sequoia Capital. Um, Don said that he was, you know, he was glad that he'd been a water polo player because he knew how to hold his breath when he walked down the <laughs> Atari assembly line because everyone was smoking pot, you know. Um, it was a crazy place. They literally held uh, meetings in hot tubs. They, they published borderline pornographic short stories in their employee newsletter. I mean, just, just crazy, crazy stuff. I went over to two of these women who'd worked at Atari during that time. And someone from the Atari leadership had been up for a kind of a lifetime achievement award. And um, that honor was taken away. They, they weren't given that um, honor in part because of the shenanigans around women at Atari. I mean, these, these uh, hot tub parties, people weren't in bathing suits. And um, I, I said to these women, did you hear that this happened? It had happened that very day that the honor had been uh, rescinded. Expecting, I think, to hear them sort of, oh, finally, you know, someone recognizes what a terrible place this was for us. And they were furious. They were so angry. They said, you know, no one understands what this was like for us. Like we wanted to be in those hot tubs. The, the pill had just been invented. We had been, we'd grown up thinking we were never going to be anything but secretaries or, or teachers, which are wonderful things to be. They were the only options for these women. And then only until they had kids, you know, or got married, then they would be fired. And this for the first time at Atari, no, they were in with the boys, there were female video game programmers. They were part of this, what was happening. And they were so offended that the sort of 21st century read on what had happened had completely distorted in their mind their experience. Now, granted, this was two women out of an entire company. But I thought that was fascinating. Yeah, that is really fascinating. And I think it's an important reminder that companies arise because of a very distinct culture where people are voluntarily a part of this culture. And, you know, it's easy to judge from the outside, especially with, you know, decades of armchair analysis or whatever the case is, but going to the source of the issues and asking, you know, them, what, what was it really like is what's, it, it should be what history is all about. So as you're thinking about the you know future projects and how you want to go about chronicling or you know focusing on the next historical work that you're doing what's that process like and what's on your radar right now that you think is you know needs to be read by or seen by a larger group of people something that i think is going to be really interesting for um, people to look back on is the shifting understanding uh, and value that people place on these tech companies. I mean, it's super interesting because, of course, we were dealing with the tech lash, right? Uh, right up to, to the pandemic. Uh, 
Silicon Valley starts out, no one pays attention to it. Then when people finally start to pay attention to Silicon Valley in the 80s and 90s, it's seen as this sort of savior of, the, of an American economy that's under threat from basically foreign uh, competitors. And so the steel industry is suffering in the face of Japanese competition, the televisions, uh, automobiles, and Silicon Valley is going to save us all. Um, and then you have the dot-com bust happen and people get very angry at Silicon Valley for, you know, essentially selling vaporware and promising more than they can deliver and all these people lose all this money. Then it slowly starts to climb back up until the cool thing to do by the time you're in the, the 2010s is to go work uh, for a tech company. This is, you know, people are getting computer science degrees left and right, and it's the way to get rich, and it's the way to have an impact. I don't want to discount the idealism that a lot of people brought to this. That's what I love about history, is I've had the chance to, to look back and be one of those people to say, how do we understand this? What do the people back then have to tell us um, about why that mattered and how it happened? And we get to decide what do we do with that information. But we are also the people that, whose stories are going to make up the, the history for the future. And that's been an incredible part of what we're experiencing now. Leslie, that was an awesome answer. And it's been really fun talking to you today. We're going to have to get you back on for round two at some point. Thanks so much for joining us and to everyone listening. We will see you next time. I'm Sophia Bush, and you've been listening to Hidden in Plain Sight from Mission.org. This podcast is sponsored by our friends at Splunk, the Data to Everything platform. In today's data-driven world, every company, big or small, new or old, is sitting on terabytes of unused, untapped, and unknown data. Splunk helps turn all that data into action. Using cutting-edge AI and machine learning, Splunk delivers real-time predictive insights that will help you on your mission to change the world. With solutions for IT, security, Internet of Things, and business operations, Splunk empowers people to make faster, better decisions and take action to get things done. It's time for our data to be more than a record of what happened. It's time to make things happen. Check it out.